warm welcome to everyone who has come here today to worship the triune God. For our worship service today, we'll follow the order of worship that you find printed in the bulletin, and that order is morning praise. Today we continue with the eighth part of our series for the summer, Courageous Living in Turbulent Times. We'll be considering uh, what we find in the book of Daniel chapter 7. Let's begin our worship service today by singing the opening hymn, and that hymn is number 240. It's found printed in the red hymnal. the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mighty judge of all people, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We have not lived up to our calling as your faithful people. So often we have done the evil you forbid, and too many times we have not done the good you demand. We do repent and are truly sorry for our sins in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us, merciful Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son. Forgive us all wrongs that need your grace, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, Direct us to serve you faithfully all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord. If this is our heartfelt confession, then there is good news for us. The Heavenly Father sent us his Son Jesus to atone for our sins. In him, God's kingdom has already come among us. 
This does not come to us because we confess it, but because God's grace, God's choice, God's intervention in Jesus saves us from our sins. Do you believe this? I do so believe. Because of Christ's redemptive work, we are a redeemed and forgiven people. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This very forgiveness is God's good news for us today, for tomorrow, forever. Amen. Amen. Please rise. save me, O oh God. O oh Lord, come quickly to help me. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Come, O oh come, let us worship. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come enter in with our songs of praise. Come enter in with thanksgiving. You are a great and a wondrous God. Copying in your hands all the depths of earth. You made the hills and the mountains high. You made the seas and the dry land. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come enter in with our songs of praise. Come enter in with thanksgiving. Come let us worship and bow in low. Kneel before the one who has made us all. You are the God whom we call our own. We are the flock that you shepherd. Come, oh, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come enter in with our songs of praise. Come enter in with thanksgiving. You may be seated. The first scripture lesson for this, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, the eleventh Sunday after Pentecost, excuse me, is the Old Testament lesson recorded in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. The first scripture lesson will serve as our sermon text for this morning. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. 
The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision uh, at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes, like the eyes of a human being, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. <coughs> then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Here ends the first scripture lesson. The psalm for today is Psalm 73. You're invited to join with me in singing the psalm of the day as it's printed in the bulletin. Is 
now and will be forever. Amen. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure The second scripture lesson is the epistle lesson recorded in Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning at verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, uh, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. <coughs> They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Here ends the second scripture lesson. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 21. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Here ends the Holy Gospel. We continue by singing the hymn of the day, which is printed in the bulletin. You may be seated.
and hear my only portion, make my shield and tower. The God of Abraham prays, who's all sufficient grace, shall guide me all my pilgrim days in all my ways. I shall behold his face, I shall his power adore, and he shall save me to thee and through blood. There dwells the Lord our King, the Lord of righteousness, triumphant o'er the world and sin the Prince of Peace. On Zion's sacred height, Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today is Daniel chapter 7. I'll read uh, the last uh, two verses of the text printed in the bulletin, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever been physically affected by what you've seen with your eyes? I think it's safe to say that people are often physically affected by what they see. I mean, some things that a person sees can revulse them, make them sick, if you will. And of course, terrorists know this. That is why when terrorists do their terror, they not only perform their atrocities, but they often want to videotape it and take pictures of it and air it so that people can see it and be sickened and terrified by it. You may not realize it, but when Daniel was given the vision in chapter 7, it physically affected him. Midway through the chapter, Daniel says this, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit and the vision that passed through my mind disturbed me. And then at the end of the chapter he says this, I Daniel was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale but I kept the matter to myself. And then when we get to chapter 8, the vision of the ram and the goat, at the end of the chapter we hear Daniel was appalled, physically worn out and exhausted from what he saw. In a certain sense, you could say that what Daniel saw made him sick. And what did Daniel see? Well, we're going to come to that, but let's first of all realize when he saw what he saw. Daniel, at the time he saw this vision, was still part of that Babylonian empire. Nebuchadnezzar had died, and now one of his sons was on the throne. 
Daniel was probably around 65 years old when he dreamt this dream. So this would have been around 15 years before he was fed to the lions. And even at 65, he had well outlived his life expectancy. Little did he know that he would live at least another 15 or so years. I'm sure it was like any other night. Daniel went to bed, closed his eyes, but God showed him something. Something that was quite disturbing. Four beasts. A horrifying fourth beast with a horn that had eyes and actually spoke. And I suppose if you were to say to Daniel, Daniel, which one of these beasts would you like to live under? I mean, pick one. What would Daniel say to that? He'd say, none, neither. I, no, no, thank you. None of the above. Now, I don't know what kind of beast God would use to depict the United States of America if he were to do that today, but I do know this. This past week, we just concluded in our country the second convention of the two major parties in our country. And now what are we told? Pick one, right? You gotta pick one of these two people to be the next president of the United States. And what's the reaction of a lot of people from that vision, that picture of either of these two being in the office of president? <laughs> It's, en it's enough to make a person ill, right? It's enough to make a person sick. At least that's what I hear a lot of people saying. Today I'd like to use that phrase as we consider Daniel chapter 7. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough, first of all, to make a person sick. What did Daniel see? Well, he saw a vision of kings and kingdoms. And in chapter 7, we learn that Daniel saw the Great Sea. That's often referred to as the Mediterranean Sea. And in the vision, he saw the winds come from the four corners of the earth and churned up the sea. You might say that's political turmoil. And out of the sea come these four beasts. And let's take a look at them, okay? The first beast was a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. And while Daniel was watching, the wings were torn off. The lion stood up and was given the heart of a man. Whether you realize it or not, this very figure was used by the Babylonians at the gateways of their city, a lion with wings on it. And when we hear about a lion given the mind of a man, we remember what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar, right? He went crazy because he boasted against God, but eventually he was able to stand up on his feet and his sanity was restored to him. So I think it's a safe bet to identify the Babylonian Empire with the first beast, the lion with the wings of an eagle. Next comes a bear, and the bear has in its mouth three ribs, and it is told, go, kill, eat, fill yourself with flesh. I think it's safe to identify this kingdom as the Medo-Persian Empire, which was bent on conquest. And of course, Daniel lived <coughs> through the day when the Babylonian Empire fell away and the Medo-Persian Empire arose. The third beast that comes out of the great sea is a leopard, a very fast animal. And if it's not fast enough, it's given four wings so it can move extremely fast, and it has four heads. I think it's safe to identify this animal as the Greek Empire that was in a certain sense established by Alexander the Great, who in just 12 short years conquered the Persian Empire with only 30,000 men. We know about Alexander that he died at a very young age and his kingdom was divided among four generals, maybe those four heads on that very swift leopard. But then finally we get to that fourth beast. And it's not even a named beast, it's just described as horrible and ferocious. We hear about it that it has iron teeth 
and that it has ten horns. Horns, of course, symbolize power. And we learn later in the chapter that it had bronze claws. And this beast was unlike the other beasts because it devoured and crushed underfoot the entire world. And so I think it's safe to identify this beast as the Roman Empire. So what is Daniel seeing in his dream? He's seeing a succession of earthly kings and kingdoms that would do what kings and kingdoms do, and that is to devour, crush, conquer, and destroy. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, Pastor, how, how can you do that? How can you identify those four beasts and define them for us? Well, you know, if we have problems interpreting the Bible, we have to follow the only true way of interpreting the Bible, and what is that? Use the Bible to interpret the Bible. So let's go back to chapter 2 and remember that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of that mighty statue, right? The top was gold, next came silver, next came bronze, and next came iron, right? And Daniel identified for Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold. He said, you king are the head of gold. So the head of gold was the Babylonian Empire. Okay, there we go. So let's connect the dots. The head of gold, Babylonian Empire, would be that first beast that came out of the water, the lion with the wings of an eagle. The second layer on the statue, the silver, that was the Medo-Persian Empire. We can connect that with the bear with the three ribs in his mouth. The third part of the statue, bronze, right? The Greek Empire. We can connect that with a leopard that had four wings and four heads. And then that fourth horrible, horrific looking beast with the ten horns and the iron teeth, we can connect that beast with the legs of iron on the statue. In a certain sense, Daniel is seeing the same thing that he saw in that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Although it's interesting because when Daniel sees this, he's at a loss of what all of this means. And he taps somebody on the shoulder in his dream, probably an angel, and says, hey, can you explain all of this to me? And so that angel gladly explains uh, the, the meaning uh, of what Daniel has seen in his dream. But again, the bottom line is that the vision is a, a, a depiction of what's going to happen in the future pertaining to earthly governments and earthly kings. And it is not a pretty picture at all, especially when it comes to that fourth beast that conquers and devours and grinds everyone and everything underfoot. It's a terrifying picture. It's enough to make you sick if you think about it. And if you were Daniel and you were looking at these beasts, you might think to yourself, oh, I don't want to live in, under any of them. I don't, want to, I don't want to exist under the rule of any of these kings. They're all horrible and monstrous. And we may be thinking the same thing today as we think about earthly kings and earthly rulers. God establishes government uh, and he intends it to be a blessing for us, but people who hold office in government are sinful people and they often act in sinful ways. And when we see that or when we think about uh, government under this person, under government under that person, it's just a sickening thought to many of us. We may think to ourselves, oh boy, no thank you, none of the above. Or the opposite of that would be, wow, well, maybe if I cozy up to one of these beasts, things will go well for me. People of God, don't be fooled. Do not cozy up to a beast like this. You remember Siegfried and Roy, those two guys that had that animal act of tigers in Las Vegas? You remember what happened to Roy? Roy Horn, eventually one day one of those tigers turned on him and attacked him. Do not think you can cozy up to a beast because a beast is going to do what a beast does, trample, destroy. It's enough to make a person ill. But now, let's go to that fourth beast. That's the one that Daniel was especially interested in, and that's the one depicted on the slide. 
Daniel's is curious about this fourth beast. It's different than the other three. It's not even identified as a creature that walks the earth. It's terrifying. It has ten horns, but Daniel's especially interested in that one horn that uproots three other horns. That one horn that has the eyes of a human being. That one horn that has the mouth of a man that speaks boastfully. It's more imposing. It's blaspheming against God. And later in the chapter, we're told this about it. It waged war against the holy people, defeating them until the Ancient of Days pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. His horn spoke against the Most High, oppressed his people, and tried to change the set times and the laws, and that God's people would be handed over to this horn for time, times, and a half time. Time, a year, times, two years, so now we have three years, and a half time would be a half a year, or three and a half years. Some period of time during which God, God's people would be oppressed by this blasphemous horn. And now think about it. Daniel's the guy who's been praying for God's people and pleading for God's people. And now God shows him this vision of what's in store for God's people. This monstrous horn that appears and starts to speak blasphemy against God and oppress God's people. This it must have made Daniel especially ill to see a vision of the future that predicted this kind of stuff. But now you're asking, of course, okay, Pastor Bauer, what, who, who or what is that horn? Who or what is that horn? You know, the beasts do what the beasts do. They trample, crush, destroy, kill. But this horn has its focus against God and against God's holy people. That's what makes it different. Many answers have been given as to what might be represented by this horn. Since it's part of that fourth beast, the Roman Empire, and since those horns probably represent kings, well maybe it's an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, the, the Roman Empire that persecuted God's people. And were there emperors like that? Absolutely, starting with Nero. In Friday morning men's Bible class, we've been studying the first three centuries of Christianity after the book of Acts, and we've learned what happened in the Christian church during those centuries, and there were many emperors who arose and persecuted God's people. One especially nasty guy was a guy named Diocletian, who around the year 300 instituted a horrific persecution against God's people, especially in the city of Alexandria, Egypt. So maybe that horn with the eyes and the mouth and the boastful mouth, you know, maybe that horn is a, an, an emperor. <coughs> maybe. Others have tried to connect that horn with what we heard in our epistle lesson for today in 2 Thessalonians. In that reading, Paul writes about the man of lawlessness, known as the Antichrist. Well, let's just define that term for a second, okay? Anti usually means against, against Christ. Have there been those who have been blatantly against Christ down through the centuries? Absolutely. Are there people and forces like that today against Christ? Oh, yes, absolutely, and more and more so in our country today. But the word anti can also mean in place of. In other words, somebody who tries to take the place of God or stand in the seat or place of God. And for many centuries, from the 13th until the 19th century, people like John Wycliffe and even Sir Isaac Newton have identified that man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians as the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. 
In the days of Luther, Luther clearly did that, and the reformers did that as well. They didn't connect the man of lawlessness, however, with that horn in Daniel chapter 7, but the connections are obvious. In the days of Luther, the papacy was responsible for the burning of Christians to death, men like John Huss, or the Inquisition. But what really got Luther fired up and riled up against the papacy was that the Pope himself refused to stand against the diabolical practice of selling those indulgences for money. He was especially upset that his church leader, the Pope, wouldn't stand up against that abusive practice. It is the Pope who claims to sit in the seat of Christ and be the vicar for Christ and the one who, when he speaks authoritatively, his words are on a par with the Holy Scriptures. The church's diabolical teaching that comes from the Council of Trent that declares all who believe that they are justified by grace through faith apart from the works of the law are eternally condemned. Still the official teaching of that church which condemns you and I today because that's exactly what we believe. But to me the most recent and diabolical teaching that harms God's people is the teaching that says eh, it doesn't matter what God you believe in or, or what God you worship eh, we're all getting to heaven you know that damning teaching of universalism but as long as you work that's the main thing it's like they'll defend uh, they'll, they'll defend anything and everything but if you go off the track and say hey I, I'm gonna go to heaven by faith and not by works oh you're eternally condemned Whatever the case, whatever this horn might be, the picture is of oppression and hard times for God's people. It was enough to make Daniel extremely ill and imagine how bad it would be if the vision ended and he woke up. It'd be a true nightmare, right? But the vision goes on. Praise be to God. And what Daniel sees is enough to make him rejoice and be glad. First, he sees the Ancient of Days. And I think it's safe for us to identify the Ancient of Days as God the Father. He is seated on his throne. Thrones are set in place. The Ancient of Days takes his seat on the throne. And the throne has wheels on it. It kind of reminds us of the throne that Ezekiel saw in his book. Ezekiel, who was also a captive in the land of Babylon. From the throne flows a river of fire, and the Ancient of Days is attended by 10 million angels. I think that's 10,000 times 10,000, at least that's what my calculator said. 10 million. 10 million angels attend the Ancient of Days. The books are opened. Well, that's definitely a picture of Judgment Day, right? And when this happens, one called the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days. Isn't that the term that Jesus often used for himself during his life here on this earth? The Son of Man. And isn't that the term that he used for himself in our Gospel lesson for today? The Son of Man will come on the clouds. And so the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, and he is given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Didn't Jesus himself say this in Matthew 28, before he ascended into heaven? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, even today. Jesus doesn't have to wait until Judgment Day. Even today, he has all power and authority in heaven and on earth. Chapter 7 says, All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. The Bible declares, Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, acknowledging Jesus to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. 
And the Ancient of Days then pronounces judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. The sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under the heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. And when I hear that, I think of what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. The meek will inherit the earth. Despite the vision of the four beasts, despite God laying out for Daniel the progression of kingdoms that will exist in this world, ultimately what happens? The Ancient of Days appears. Ultimately what happens? The Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven with all of his holy angels and overrules all of the efforts of those kingdoms of the world. And that's when the kingdom of Christ is put on full display. A kingdom that is an everlasting kingdom. A kingdom that is your kingdom. And there's one final thing that happens, and it particularly has to do with that fourth beast, with the ten horns and the boastful horn and the iron teeth. We are told in Daniel chapter 7, the fourth beast is slain and its body is destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire fire. His power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever and ever. You might call this the, the battle of the little big horn. Because that little horn that became big and boastful, well guess what? It loses in the battle against the Ancient of Days and is destroyed forever and ever. But it's true about every earthly kingdom. It comes and it goes. Even the most formidable ones. The other beasts are stripped of their power as well. But what is the meaning for all of this for you and for me today? Well, I think if that three and a half year period of time during which the horn is boasting and bragging and oppressing God's people is the New Testament era, then you and I live in that period of time. And we may not realize it because we live in a country where there isn't very much persecution of God's people at all. But you should probably realize that each and every year throughout the earth, 8,000 of your brothers and sisters in Christ are killed because they are Christians. And we heard about one of those this past week in France, an 80-some-year-old man who was executed in a church performing a worship service. 8,000. That's one per hour. And as we think about that, we might think to ourselves, God, why are you allowing that to happen? What, why, what is the purpose of all of this? You have the power. Why not just put an end to all of it? We must remember as God's people that the Ancient of Days will sit on his throne. The Son of Man attends him. The beasts will be destroyed even as they rage and foment against the Ancient of Days. The meek will inherit the earth. And as we see this picture, it has one effect on us, right? It's enough to make us rejoice. It's enough to make us glad. It's enough to make us hopeful. It's enough to make us resilient and persistent as God's people. So the conventions are done, you saw them on TV, and now you're told you must pick. I think it was interesting that one of the conventions was described as gloom and doom and the other was described as optimistic. What was God's portrayal like of the future of the earth? You might think, whoa, gloom and doom, right? Suffering and agony. but. At the end, the Ancient of Days ascends his throne and the Son of Man attends him. Pick one of the beasts, Daniel. I mean, Daniel would have as much problem as people today, right? Pick, pick one of the candidates. No, thank you. None of them, none of the above don't want any of them. Well, we don't have to pick one. What we need to do is wait. We need to wait for the Ancient of Days to ascend his throne and the Son of Man to attend him. We need to believe 
The, the Son of Man has been given as true God and true man all authority in heaven and on earth. And we need to do our best to survive under whatever kingdom we might live under. That is our job, to survive, live, be the light and salt of this earth. And one final thing. When the Ancient of Days ascends his throne and the books are opened, one of those books is the Lamb's Book of Life. And you know whose name is written in there? Your name. My name. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is the reservation book for that mansion known as heaven. Let's see, oh yes, got a reservation here for you. And that reservation is written in the blood of, not a beast, not a monster with horrible teeth, but in the blood of the one who is the lamb, right? The lamb who shed his blood to pay for our sin. The lamb who gave his life so that we could have eternal life with him forever in heaven. That, my friends, is enough to make us rejoice and be glad and be who we are, the hopeful people of God. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now confess our faith using the words of the Te Deum Canticle in which we sing about the martyrs of God's holy church. offers praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O holy, holy, all creation offers praise. With the angels in heaven, we praise Cherubim and Seraphim, we praise you, we praise you. With apostles and prophets, we praise you, we praise you. With the martyrs and your holy church, we sing in endless praise. We praise you, we praise you, O Spirit most holy. We praise you, we praise you, to the Trinity most blessed, singing endless praise. You are God, we praise you. risen to free us. 
we praise you, we praise you, and with all your saints in glory, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O oh Father, holy, all creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. We worship God with our offerings. You may be seated. Rise for prayer. <coughs> Dear God, how generous you are, providing us with all that we need for our souls and bodies. Instill in us a spirit of generosity and unselfishness that makes us willing to spend and be spent for you. Satisfy our personal needs and ever provide the means whereby we may help our neighbor and give rich offerings for your work. May Christ who placed his very life in our service dwell in us, causing us to live our lives and give ourselves for you. In his name we pray, amen. morning, O oh Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we include a prayer for Kristen Plouts, the daughter-in-law of Bill and Pat, who severely burned her hand this past week. And we also offer a prayer for George Bame, Donna Bolzman's brother-in-law, who underwent back surgery this past week, we pray. Ancient of days, you made sure that Daniel saw in a dream what we today are living through right now, namely that three and a half year period of the New Testament era. There are many forces that stand against you and against your son. 
Some claim to be Christ, to sit in the seat of Christ, and the result of all of that is oppression for your people. If that were the end of the vision that you gave to Daniel, that would be enough to make a person sick. And yet, you still watch over your people. You still watch over those who suffer through persecution for the sake of your son throughout the world. Protect and ultimately deliver those who suffer for the sake of Christ. Ancient of days, as you sat upon your throne, your son, the son of man, approached. And he came and destroyed the, pe the beast and gave to your people the eternal kingdom. He precedes the beast, he outlasts them all. All authority in heaven and on earth has not been granted to them, but to your son, who is both God and man, who is our savior from sin. Help us, Ancient of Days, to learn another lesson from the vision you gave to Daniel, not to place our trust in any beast. We may be frustrated over the politics in our country and the efficiency of our government, but you have warned us to be leery, to not put our trust in any earthly authority, lest we be torn to pieces and that beast turn on us. Help us to always put our trust only in you only in Jesus our Savior as the only source of salvation and life. Ancient of days, we ask your mercy and grace for Kristen Plouts, the daughter-in-law of Bill and Pat. Watch over her as she recovers from her burn. Uh, relieve her pain and grant her healing and health according to your will. In Ancient of Days, we thank you for allowing George Bame, Donna Bolzman's brother-in-law, to get through surgery. Grant that the surgery is effective and grant him healing so that he has relief from pain and removal of numbness and can once again be mobile and pain free in his life. Ancient of Days, we offer you our thanks that this past week 11 members of this congregation gathered to plan our, our VBS and to work on it. And we thank you for the 80 plus kids who have already registered for our vacation Bible school. Help all of us to seize the opportunity to boldly proclaim the coming of the Son of Man is coming to save. And finally, Ancient of Days, you ascended your throne. The Son of Man approaches you. Come, finally, surrounded by your holy angels, and grant deliverance to your people, and take us home. Your church continues to cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger and in all we do direct us to what is right in your sight through jesus christ your son our lord amen let us praise the lord thanks be to god the Lord bless and keep you. Amen. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. Amen. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. Closing hymn is hymn 256, printed in the red hymnal.
thy hands hath made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty the congregation, we welcome the visitors who joined us for worship today. There are a few announcements. 
On Tuesday, our church council will meet at 7 p.m. at the Bauer House. The address is listed in the bulletin. And council members are encouraged to park at the community center, which is a half a block to the south of the Bauer House since there's no parking on the street. On Thursday, uh, we'll continue our Bible class in the basement studying the book of Nehemiah. And on Friday, there is no men's Bible class. We finished our study and we'll pick that up in the fall. We did have a VBS uh, organizational meeting this past week and I think there's about 85 kids registered for VBS and probably 20 for sand volleyball camp and so things are progressing with that. Uh, again, I was especially heartened that we had 11 members there who uh, in one way or another are going to make Vacation Bible School a reality at our church and you can see some of the crafts uh, that are being worked on on the tables downstairs uh, after church when you go down there for uh, something to eat and drink. Concerning our preschool, we right now are at uh, 21 enrolled for the fall. Uh, that would be nine four-year-olds and 12 three-year-olds. And so we still continue to have interest in our preschool. And so hopefully, God willing, that uh, enrollment list will go up as well. And we today thank Joan for playing for our service. That's the second time in recent history that Joan has played, and also Toby. Uh, who, uh, whom God has uh, blessed richly with the gift when it comes to playing the uh, uh, acoustical guitar. Thank you, Toby. There is something to eat and drink after the service today, so please uh, stay for that. Otherwise, those are the announcements.